Today's treaty hearing comes at a time when the importance of strengthening our bonds and reinforcing the rule of law is as clear as ever. So I'm grateful to the ranking member for helping make this hearing happen. And I also want to thank both panels of highly qualified experts for appearing today. Our committee has a critical constitutional role to play in the treaty making process. And what we do directly impacts US national security, law enforcement, businesses, and consumers. While the treaties on the agenda today cover varied subject matters, they have a common feature. They all make technical updates to frameworks from years past, updates that are required to maximize our engagement with other countries, and in the case of the Tuna Treaty Amendments and Kigali, for our industries to stay competitive. Turning first to the pair of bilateral law enforcement treaties with Croatia, we know that modern criminal networks do not observe international borders. Terrorists, cyber criminals, drug traffickers aren't limited to one country or another, and addressing the threat they pose requires intense cooperation. These treaties with Croatia will improve our law enforcement relationship with Croatia, enhancing the ability to extradite criminals, share information, and exchange evidence for investigations and prosecutions. Next, we'll hear testimony about amendments to the 1987 South Pacific Tuna Treaty. The Tuna Treaty has long been a cornerstone of U.S. economic interests in the South Pacific and our relations with other countries in the region. Reinforcing those bonds is more important than ever, especially in the face of growing Chinese influence. Our fishing industry and U.S. consumers have long benefited from access to fishing waters in the Pacific, but our fishing, uh, our fishing fleet needs a better deal, which these amendments would provide. For instance, the amendments would make it easier for U.S. fishing vessels to fish on the high seas. And the new amendments would allow U.S. businesses to negotiate commercial fishing arrangements directly with our Pacific Island partners without the federal government as a middleman. The Tuna Treaty has long been vital to U.S. economic interests and our strategic influence in the region, and modernizing it will support even more economic activity and further burnish our relationships with important partners. Finally, we will look at the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol. The United States ratified the Montreal Protocol more than three decades ago, and as U.S. companies have innovated and developed new technologies and products, the Senate has approved four amendments to keep up with those advances. The Kigali Amendment modernizes the Montreal Protocol by addressing chemicals called hydrofluorocarbons, HFCs. HFCs became a commonplace alternative to dangerous ozone-depleting substances in response to the Montreal Protocol, but we know now that they are dangerous in their own right. Beginning with the engagement and encouragement of the George W. Bush administration, U.S. manufacturers have led the development of the next generation of refrigerants and technologies to replace HFCs, and President Trump took a major step towards domestic adoption of this next-gen technology by signing the AIM Act into law. Senate approval of the Kigali will help U.S. businesses, including manufacturers in Texas, Tennessee, and Wisconsin, develop and access global markets. And it is necessary so that they don't get locked out from trade with other partners to the treaty. We have received an outpouring of support for the Kigali Amendment from the business community, including many letters. This includes letters from Walmart, Carrier, Lennox, and others. And I ask for consent to enter these letters into the record, and we'll provide them to the clerk. Without objection, so ordered. Industry estimates calculate that ratifying the Kigali Amendment will help increase U.S. exports by $5 billion and create 33,000 U.S. manufacturing jobs. In contrast, our exports and export-related jobs are predicted to contract significantly if we fail to do so. All, previous, all four previous amendments passed with bipartisan support, and I hope this one will as well. I'm pleased that we have an opportunity today to hear from government experts on international cooperation in these areas, acting legal advisor to the State Department, Richard Visek, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State John Thompson from the Oceans Environment and Science Bureau, 
and Vaughn Airy, the Director of the Office of International Affairs at the Department of Justice. Testifying on our second panel of industry experts, we have Mr. Stephen Yorick, CEO of the Air Conditioning, Heating, and Refrigeration Institute, based in Arlington, Virginia, who will testify on the significance of the Kongali Amendment, and Mr. James, Mr. Jim Sousa, President of the America Tuna Boat Association and Director of GS Fisheries from San Diego, California, who is here to testify on the amendments to the South Pacific Tuna Treaty. With that, let me turn to the distinguished ranking member, Senator Risch, for his remarks. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, scheduling this hearing. Obviously, treaties is one of the important things that this committee does and kind of gets lost with the swamp of uh, all of the uh, nominations that we have to do, but it is important and deserves our attention. So from the uh, State uh, Department and Department of Justice, we will hear how the Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty with Croatia will help streamline the process for securing the evidence and testimony we need to enforce our laws. We'll also update our current extradition treaty, making it adaptable to advances in criminal law in the United States. The State Department will also discuss the South Pacific Tuna Treaty. This agreement, submitted under the last administration, establishes stable and predictable fishing rights for U.S. Uh, vessels fishing in the exclusive economic zone waters of certain island nations of the South Pacific. This treaty updates our existing agreements and strengthens our cooperation and partnership with these island nations, particularly at a time when China is attempting to increase its influence in that part of the Pacific. Finally, we will hear from the State Department on the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol. The Senate has consented to ratification of the previous four amendments to the Montreal Protocol with strong bipartisan votes. With ratification of this treaty, the U.S. will join more than 120 countries in a multi-decade plan to phase down the production and consumption of 18 highly polluting substances known as HFCs. The treaty will facilitate the transition to the next generation of refrigerants. This benefits our U.S. industry, which enjoys a strong competitive advantage in the production of successor substances to HFCs. Finally, I'll note that we passed legislation last Congress, the American Innovation and Manufacturing Act, which implements U.S. obligations under this treaty. With ratifications uh, of the, this amendment, the U.S. can better position itself to uphold our interest as we transition away from these substances to the newer, more efficient substances that will replace HFCs globally. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Rich. So we will start with our first panel, and I'll start with Mr. Visek uh, from the uh, State Department. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I am pleased to appear before you today to testify in support of two law enforcement treaties being considered by the committee, the Extradition and Mutual Legal Assistance Treaties with the Republic of Croatia. I am also pleased to be joined on this panel by two distinguished colleagues, Vaughn Ari from the Department of Justice's Office of International Affairs, who will also be testifying in support of these important law enforcement agreements, and Dr. John Thompson, from the Bureau of Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs, who will testify in support of two other important treaties, the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol and the amendments to the Treaty on Fisheries with certain Pacific Island states. The agreements with Croatia will modernize and strengthen our law enforcement cooperation relationship with an important European partner and improve our ability to combat transborder crime including terrorism, other forms of violent crime, drug trafficking, cybercrime, and the laundering of the proceeds of criminal activity. In addition, these treaties will further our project to conform our law enforcement treaties with member states of the European Union to the standards established in our extradition and mutual legal assistance agreements with the European Union. The U.S. extradition relationship with Croatia is currently governed by a 1901 treaty with the then Kingdom of Serbia which is not as effective as the modern treaties we have in force with other countries and does not contain provisions required by the agreement on extradition between the United States of America and the European Union. We do not currently have a mutual legal assistance agreement in place with Croatia and the treaty now before you would serve to implement bilaterally the agreement on mutual legal assistance between the United States of America and the European Union. Together, these two treaties would establish a modern law enforcement cooperation relationship with Croatia. 
updating outdated extradition treaties with modern ones is necessary to create a seamless web of mutual obligations to facilitate the prompt location, arrest, and extradition of international fugitives. For their part, treaty-based mutual legal assistance mechanisms facilitate our ability to obtain evidence and other forms of assistance in support of our criminal investigations and prosecutions. As a result, these treaties are an important part of the administration's efforts to ensure that those who commit crimes against Americans will face justice in the United States. The new U.S.-Croatia extradition agreement contains several important provisions that will serve our law enforcement objectives. I will touch briefly on these provisions. First, it incorporates the contemporary dual criminality approach. Whereas the 1901 treaty provides for extradition only for offenses appearing on a closed list, the new agreement covers any offense punishable by imprisonment for a period of more than one year under the laws of both states. The dual criminality approach eliminates the need to renegotiate treaties to cover new offenses in instances in which both states pass laws to address new types of criminal activity. Second, the new extradition treaty contains a provision that permits the temporary surrender to the United States of a person facing prosecution or serving a sentence in Croatia. This provision can be important so that, for example, charges pending against the person can be resolved earlier while evidence is fresh, or so he or she can be prosecuted alongside any co-defendants. And third, the new extradition treaty incorporates other improvements that can expedite or streamline extradition processes, including by providing clarity on the materials required for formal extradition requests, as well as incorporating a simplified procedure when an individual consents to extradition. For its part, the new U.S.-Croatia Mutual Legal Assistance Agreement formalizes a framework for cooperation on those issues regulated by the U.S.-EU Mutual Legal Assistance Agreement, such as the identification of bank information, the use of video conference technology, and a process to transmit expedited requests. This agreement will facilitate assistance between our countries in criminal investigations and prosecutions. For all these reasons, U.S. ratification of these two law enforcement treaties will help us and our colleagues at the Justice Department deepen our law enforcement relationship with Croatia and advance our objective combating transnational crime. Thank you once again for the opportunity to appear before you to address these treaties, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ari, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee. I am pleased to appear before you today to express the support of the Department of Justice for the extradition and mutual legal assistance treaties between the United States and the Republic of Croatia. It is my privilege to serve as the Director of the Office of International Affairs, which is the section within the Justice Department that implements extradition and mutual legal assistance treaties for the benefit of all federal, state, and local law enforcement investigations and prosecutions. As an initial matter, I would like to thank our colleagues at the Department of State for working with us for many years to negotiate these agreements with Croatia. We work closely with our partners at State to execute our law enforcement treaties, and the Office of International Affairs relies on these treaty relationships to return international fugitives to face prosecution in the United States and to obtain essential evidence. Prosecutors benefit from this network of treaties, and we are grateful to this committee for its work in building and modernizing them to meet the law enforcement challenges of the 21st century. I would like to highlight three important reasons why the new treaties with Croatia will be vital law enforcement tools for prosecutors across the nation. First, the new extradition treaty will allow extradition for a wider range of serious crimes. The United States and Croatia currently operate under the 1901 extradition treaty between the United States and Kingdom of Serbia. This new treaty replaces a short list of extraditable offenses that is well over a century old. The more modern dual criminality approach will enable us to extradite individuals for conduct punishable under the laws of both countries by more than a year of imprisonment. This means the new extradition treaty will now cover terrorism, cybercrime, child pornography, money laundering, and other offenses. It also future-proofs the treaty by ensuring that new crimes remain covered as the criminal codes of both countries evolve to meet future challenges. Second, the new treaty includes provisions that make the extradition process more efficient. 
For example, the new temporary transfer provision means we will be able to seek the extradition of someone imprisoned in Croatia for immediate trial in the United States and return him or her to serve out the remainder of their sentence in Croatia. The simplified extradition provision allows a person sought in extradition to consent to surrender, resulting in a more expeditious transfer to the requesting country. And the new treaty also modernizes provisions for providing supplemental information and the authentication of extradition documents. Third, the new MLAT with Croatia will augment the tools available to U.S. authorities for investigating and prosecuting modern crime. The new MLAT will authorize the identification of bank information relating to persons suspected of a criminal offense, the use of video conferencing technology to take testimony, and the expedited transmission of requests for assistance. These new provisions will add to the evidence gathering tools available and build upon the strong cooperative law enforcement relationship we have with our Croatian counterparts. In addition to being vital law enforcement tools, these treaties give effect to agreements that the United States made with the European Union in 2003. Since then, the United States and the member states of the EU have updated their extradition and mutual legal assistance relationships, all but one. Croatia joined the European Union in 2013 and is the only EU member state that has not yet implemented new agreements. The treaties with Croatia now before this committee, accomplish that goal. For these reasons, Mr. Chairman, we join the State Department in respectfully requesting the prompt and favorable consideration of these important law enforcement treaties. I would be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Secretary Thompson. Chairman Menendez, Ranking Member Risch, Thank you for having me here today and for the opportunity to testify in support of amendments to two treaties that are vital to ensuring our continued prosperity and advancing the interest of American workers and important sectors of the U.S. economy. I'm Dr. John Thompson, Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Environment. The administration requests that the Senate review the following treaty amendments with a view to providing advice and consent to their ratification as soon as possible. The Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol on Substances that Deplete the Ozone Layer and amendments to the Treaty on Fisheries between the governments of certain Pacific Island states and the government of the United States of America, or the Tuna Treaty. The Montreal Protocol on Substances that Deplete the Ozone Layer, which the United States ratified in 1988, is one of the world's most successful international environmental agreements. The Kigali Amendment adds a new class of chemicals known as hydrofluorocarbons, or HFCs, as controlled substances under the protocol. The Kigali Amendment will gradually drive global markets towards lower production and consumption of HFCs and towards use of more environmentally benign replacement technologies. Industry estimates indicate U.S. ratification would support 33,000 new manufacturing jobs in the United States and $12.5 billion in new investments in the U.S. economy over the next decade. This includes achieving a substantial increase in the U.S. global export market share for heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and refrigeration equipment, which is especially important given the rapid growth in sales of these products in many developing countries. The United States will benefit economically from Kigali ratification because we have the most innovative and dynamic business community in the sectors that use HFCs and their alternatives. But U.S. companies aren't the only ones developing alternatives to HFCs. Our competitors in the EU, Japan, Mexico, China, and elsewhere are developing their own technologies. If the United States does not join Kigali, our industry risks losing out on this growing global export market, and we may also face a ban on HFC trade with parties to the amendment starting in 2033, which is not far away in an industry that looks many years ahead when planning investments. Joining Kigali maximizes our ability to continue to protect U.S. interests in the Montreal Protocol's governing body. Congress has already taken the actions needed to provide sufficient domestic authority to implement the Kigali Amendment through the American Innovation and Manufacturing Act, or AIM Act. 
we do not envision the need for further rulemaking for the United States to meet the obligations it would have under the Kigali Amendment beyond what is already planned to implement the AIM Act. Amendments to the Tuna Treaty. The, the Tuna Treaty has been a cornerstone of U.S. cooperation with the Pacific Islands for over three decades and is a vital component of the wide range of U.S. engagement and financial assistance to the region. The Tuna Treaty serves broad U.S. diplomatic interests by providing a multilateral framework to cooperate with the Pacific Island parties on one of their highest policy priorities and by supporting security, stability, and prosperity. Both the Tuna Treaty and a related economic assistance agreement with Pacific Island parties reinforce the goals of the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy to preserve a free and open Indo-Pacific, drive regional prosperity, and bolster Indo-Pacific security. The Tuna Treaty provides fishing access for U.S. commercial purse seine vessels to fish for tuna within the exclusive economic zones of 16 Pacific Island parties in the Western and Central Pacific Ocean. The United States and the Pacific Island parties concluded seven years of negotiations and adopted amendments to the Tuna Treaty on December 3, 2016. These amendments to the Tuna Treaty make it a more viable and sustainable model to manage U.S. fishing access to areas under the national jurisdiction of Pacific Island parties. The 2016 amendments to the Tuna Treaty are supported by U.S. fishing stakeholders. The United States and the Pacific Island parties have historically viewed the Tuna Treaty not simply as a fisheries agreement, but as a foundation of the economic and political relationship between the United States and the Pacific Island parties. In February, when Secretary Blinken met with Pacific Island leaders, several of them commented on the importance of the Tuna Treaty to their relationship with the United States and to their economies. I appreciate your consideration of the Kigali Amendment and the amendments to the Tuna Treaty, and I'm happy to respond to any questions you may have. Well, th uh, thank you all for your uh, testimony. We'll start a series of five-minute uh, rounds. Let me start uh, with myself. Uh, I understand that efforts to phase out HFCs have been supported for a few decades on a bipartisan and multi-stakeholder basis. For example, uh, that U.S. industry began to develop HFC alternatives with the support and encouragement of the George uh, W. Bush administration. That U.S. industry was heavily engaged in ensuring that Kigali is favorable to our business and competition interests, and that President Trump, with broad bipartisan support, signed into law the AIM Act, which provides the authority to implement Kigali. Uh, Mr. Thompson, is that accurate? Yes, Chairman, it is. Uh, in 2019, President Trump signed into law Senator Kennedy of Louisiana's America, uh, American Innovation and Manufacturing Act, which phases down HFCs in the United States consistent with the Kigali Amendment. Mr. Visek, I understand no additional authorities beyond the AIM Act are needed for the U.S. government to comply with Kigali. Is that accurate? Could you put your microphone on? You have to press the little. Okay. Well, for the record, you said that is accurate. Uh, this is the only reason I want you to put your microphone on so we have a recording going on. So I want to make sure the record re reflects it. Uh, and then I also understand the EU, Japan, South Africa, India, China, Vietnam, Mexico, Canada are all among the 130 parties to Kigali, and new prohibitions under Kigali will kick in for parties beginning in 2033, which will impact trade with non-parties. Uh, Secretary Thompson, under the provisions in Kigali on trade between parties and non-parties, what do U.S. businesses stand to lose if we don't ratify? Thank you, Chairman. Um, and the, the description you provided of the non-party trade provisions in the Kigali Amendment, are they, they are accurate. And in fact, we do stand um, to lose um, uh, quite a lot because effective January 1st, 2033, parties under the Kigali Amendment will be required as a default to prohibit trade in HFCs with non-parties. As you said, most of our major trading partners are already in the Kigali Amendment. 
Um, a number of others we know are joining in the years coming. Um, and so this, this default trade ban could have uh, the potential for significant disruption for U.S. businesses um, that would continue to trade HFCs at that time, which is what's expected because the, the HFC controls are a phase down, not a phase out. So e even in 2033, there will still be a substantial amount of HFC trade that U.S. businesses would want to be involved in. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So uh, by not ratifying, we hurt U.S. businesses. Uh, and uh, at the same time, we uh, ultimately, instead of being at the table to have to set those standards for trade, we won't be there. Is that a fair statement? That is correct. Okay. Uh, let me turn uh, to the question of the tuna treaty. Uh, you described in your comments how they are central to the health of our diplomatic relationship with other countries in the region. How does this effort counter Chinese influence? Uh, Secretary Thompson. Thank you, Chairman. I, I would say, so there's several ways where this, uh, I would say, um, directly counters Chinese influence. I think the first category is um, in the economic um, uh, competitiveness area, um, this is a very strong economic tool because it, the changes that we have here, a lot of what we're talking about are the benefits to the U.S. fleet, but they also strongly benefit the Pacific Island parties uh, themselves. These Pacific Island parties have economies that are highly dependent on the fisheries industry, and so this really is a cornerstone of our economic engagement with them. But we're not the only ones fishing in these waters. Uh, we have distant water fleets from other countries, in particular China, uh, that are operating there as well. So it's vital for our economic diplomacy that we continue to be involved there. Secondly, I'd say this is a, the model that we operate by is well understood, clear and transparent. And it's to some extent, um, uh, you know, a gold standard for um, uh, transparency and sustainable fishing in the area. Some of these other countries, including China, don't operate by the same rules. Um, and I think oftentimes the way we do it is, um, uh, is used to set the benchmark for other countries, including China, to operate in a more transparent uh, and appropriate way. And then finally, I would say we also use this um, agreement as, as uh, the foundation for a broader cooperative um, engagement with the Pacific Island countries uh, and for a wide range of assistance in areas like security, countering illegal, unregulated, um, and unreported uh, fishing, uh, sustainable fisheries, uh, as well as um, uh, maritime surveillance. And so we also uh, garner benefits from that as well, in particular as it relates to, to countering China. Thank you. Senator thank Lish. You. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I've got just a couple of questions here, and I, I don't want you to take these as being contentious. I just... I want to understand uh, where we're headed here. On the HFC uh, question, um, China can claim Article 5 developing country status, which gives it a, a longer period of time uh, to phase down as opposed to the United States. Is that going to cause us uh, difficulty going forward where they can use this uh, uh, in what I would think of would be an anti-competitive uh, nature? What, what what's what's the situation on that? Thank you, Ranking Member Rish. Um, you you are correct. China, you know, looking back at the long history of the Montreal Protocol, they are in fact classified as an, an Article Five party because in part because those classifications were made many years ago, um, and it is accurate they do have additional time. Uh, to make the reductions in HFC production and consumption because of that. Um, but I, I think overall, we do not believe it really gives them a competitive advantage um, because fundamentally what the Kigali Amendment is doing is it's pushing global markets away from HFCs and towards HFC alternatives. And if you look at, at the nature um, of these businesses now, 
China's actually quite strong in the HFC production and consumption business. They're the world's largest producer and consumer of HFCs, whereas um, where we're pushing these markets towards alternatives, um, U.S. industry has a competitive advantage in that area, and we are the world's leader in developing and deploying alternatives. And so I think um, overall, you're, you're right, there are some accommodations there. But I, I think at a strategic level, where this amendment is pushing these technologies um, is absolutely to the benefit um, of U.S. businesses, and that's why we've heard so much from them. That's clarifying. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, and one more question on China having to do with the uh, tuna fishing. Um, do, are, do they operate under a similar treaty with these uh, countries or not? My understanding is they do not have a similar multilateral arrangement uh, with these governments, and that's part of what I was talking about. The arrangements that they operate under are far less clear and transparent in nature. I, I get that. I, I can't imagine they wouldn't take advantage of that situation, uh, whether it be seasons or amount of catch or anything else. The, and I, with all due respect, uh, you, you said that these would be I, I, my words, not yours, trend setting or the gold standard or what have you. Can't imagine China would look to us for that uh, that kind of guidance, but uh, one can always be hopeful. Um, in any event, it it, it does, uh, it, it's got to be done, I understand that, and uh, uh, I hope, hope it works uh, better than what I think it's going to work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I understand Senator Van Hollen is with us virtually. Uh, he's not with us virtually. Okay. Uh, Senator Johnston? N need, need, nobody's there? Okay. Well, our list has expired, it seems. Um, well, I, I just have one, um, uh, two final questions. The Secretary Thompson, the fishing industry has played a role in, in developing these amendments to the Tuna Treaty? Absolutely, Chairman. We work very closely with them throughout the negotiations of the amendment, sir. Uh-huh. And, and in what way does, do the, does the changes benefit uh, the U.S. fishing industry? You could just uh, just give me one moment. Sure, I'm sure our second panel can answer that. But uh, what's that? Yeah. Thank you, Chairman, and sorry for the the delay. No problem. Um, so there are several beneficial aspects of this um, that I can go through quickly. Um, I think the next panel can speak in more detail. Um, but first, I'd say that portions of the high seas are no longer covered under the treaty area, which is deleted in these amendments. Um, so that means the amendments will eliminate a requirement under the treaty for U.S. vessels to obtain a license to fish on portions of the high seas. Secondly, individual vessel owners make commitments each year to purchase upfront fishing days in the waters of the Pacific Island parties. Under the previous model, the entire U.S. per seine fleet was obligated to contribute towards a lump sum total price for fishing access each year. The new, more flexible model empowers individual vessel owners to decide how many days to buy or not buy, depending on their own economic and operating conditions, and to be individually accountable uh, for those commitments. Um, Finally, I'd say the new model for fishing access also empowers U.S. industry to negotiate and purchase additional bilateral days with individual island parties, and they get to do that directly, removing U.S. government officials from serving as intermediaries in what are really purely commercial negotiations. Right. Thank you. Thank you. He's online now? Okay, now I understand Senator Van Hollen is online, so Senator Van Hollen? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, thank you, all of you for your testimony um, on these different 
uh, proposals. Um, I, I have a couple questions regarding the uh, Kigali um, Amendment. And Dr. Thompson, according to a 2021 uh, report from the U.S. Department of Energy, uh, we see that energy efficiency technologies and services employ over 2.1 million Americans uh, and that efficiency workers manufacture, sell, and install products, build well-insulated buildings, um, and weatherize homes to save energy and reduce energy bills. Uh, and that in order to phase down HFCs in refrigerants uh, and insulation materials, we'll rely on this technological innovation um, of our domestic manufacturing workforce. Uh, a study uh, from the University of Maryland, um, in my home state, uh, the, their study on inter-industry forecasting uh, pro project uh, estimates that uh, joining Kigali and its global implementation will result in 33,000 new domestic manufacturing jobs. Um, can you share any insights you have um, on how ratifying the Kigali Amendment and introducing new, more efficient energy, energy efficient technologies uh, can support uh, the expansion of our energy efficiency workforce. Thank you, Senator. Uh, and I am I am familiar with the study that you you cite. Um, I, I would perhaps say two things. I think first, you, you mentioned the 33,000 additional um, uh, jobs. We have seen uh, the same estimate. Um, and, and I think that stems from a, a couple of things. One, um, as I said before, the Kigali Amendment is really pushing global markets towards technologies where the US is a global leader and we are gonna be advantaged um, without a doubt by that. Um, and that should help us um, increase our market share um, in exports of this type of equipment, especially to developing countries. And many of those developing countries are still growing rapidly and, and in particular in um, air conditioning and refrigeration are, um, uh, have rapid growth uh, in, in those particular industries in terms of consumers purchasing those products. Um, there is, as you said, a strong energy efficiency linkage here um, that will play out over time. I, I, maybe what I would say is, you know, going back a little bit under the Montreal Protocol, um, as we've done previous technology transitions, the Montreal Protocol has really primarily focused on the refrigerant transition. But in doing so, what we've seen much more broadly is that that modernization effort to move to new technology and new refrigerants has also resulted in each new generation with improved energy efficiency in equipment. And so I think there are certainly as a part of this opportunities to see energy efficiency improvements um, and to also see uh, some of the strength in job, uh, US jobs to, to support those gains. Thank you. Well, thank you. And that addition in, um, in American jobs uh, in this area, as you say, um, will be matched uh, by U.S. exports. I mean, these, these are areas, energy, these technologies are areas where U.S. businesses are uh, playing a leading role. Uh, and that same uh, University of Maryland report uh, that I cited um, also estimates that the, the global implementation of Kigali will result in 8.4 billion dollars a year uh, of increased u.s exports and 12.5 billion of increased economic output per year is are those figures um in line with uh, your own internal estimates thank you senator i, I think certainly um we would concur with the, the direction of those benefits. We, we haven't conducted our own um, internal estimate of those specific figures, but in fact, um, we have looked at that study and we have consulted extensively with industry throughout the negotiations of the Kigali Amendment. And in fact, that, that was a major driver of what we wanted to achieve in those negotiations um, was to, to have this push towards more environmentally benign technologies and to do it in a way um, that benefited um, U.S. businesses and the U.S. economy. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank That's you. Senator Van Hollen, would you have cited that report if it wasn't the University of Maryland? 
Well, I'm not sure if it was, uh, you know, from New Jersey, but Mr. <laughs> Chairman, I'm happy to, to share the credit with uh, New Jersey. <laughs> well, we're very happy the University of Maryland uh, did that research. I think it speaks uh, very strongly to the case. Thank you very much. All right, no other members seeking recognition uh, with the thanks of the committee. This panel is excused. Um, and we will bring up our second panel. Having heard from government experts on the importance of international cooperation in these areas, I want to welcome our two industry experts, each to testify on the Kigali Amendment and the South Pacific Tuna Treaty. Our witnesses know firsthand how U.S. manufacturers and business in their sectors will benefit from the Senate approving the Kigali Amendment and the amendments to the Tuna Treaty, respectively, and the risks of not approving them. Um, Stephen Yurick is the CEO of the Air Conditioning, Heating, and Refrigeration Institute, ARI, based in Arlington, Virginia, one of the largest trade associations in the nation, representing more than 300 heating, water heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and commercial refrigeration manufacturers within the global HVA, HVACR industry. Jim Sousa is a long-serving director of GS Fisheries and president of the American Tuna Boat Association, ATA, which represents the owners and operators of the large-scale tuna purse sign fleet that operates in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, with that, um, and our thanks for your appearance and sharing your expertise, um, uh, let me... Uh, let me first turn to um, Mr. Yurick. Um, your full statement will be included in the record. You can summarize it more or less in five minutes, so we'd appreciate it, so we can ask you questions, and you're recognized. Thank you, Chairman Mendez, Ranking Member Rich, and members of the committee for inviting me to testify today. My name is Stephen Yurick, and I'm the President and CEO of the Air Conditioning, Heating, and Refrigeration Institute. AHRI's 320 members manufacture safe, efficient, and innovative air conditioning, space heating, water heating, and commercial refrigeration equipment for sale in North America and for export around the world. With a U.S. annual economic activity of approximately $256 billion and employing more than 1.3 million people, I urge the United States Senate to provide its advice and consent, and approve the Kigali Amendment, paving the way for its ratification by the United States. AHRI and its member companies strongly support U.S. ratification amendment, along with numerous other major U.S. industry associations, including the American Chemistry Council, the National Association of Manufacturers, and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Ratification serves critical business needs for American manufacturers and workers. There is no credible scenario where the failure of the United States to ratify Kigali helps American manufacturers and workers. To the contrary, failure to ratify materially harms their interests and compromises their future. This amendment will drive the growth of U.S. businesses, stimulate investment in the U.S. economy, sustain U.S. technology leadership, open export markets to U.S. products, protect U.S. workers and consumers, and ensure U.S. interests shape future international agreements. To sustain their advantage and expand their share of the global market, U.S. manufacturers have invested billions in next-generation technologies and spent more than a decade advocating for worldwide phase-down of HFCs. Today, American factories manufacture market-leading next-generation products and a federal law is phasing down domestic HFC production and consumption under the American Innovation and Manufacturing Act of 2020. Ratifying Kigali extends the commercial advantages of the AIM Act to U.S. products in export markets around the world. These export markets represent the most significant growth opportunity for U.S. manufacturers. With ratification, the U.S. share of these export markets is projected to increase by more than $6 billion annually, supporting approximately 17,000 new U.S. manufacturing jobs. Kigali represents a successful effort by the United States with the support of American manufacturers to establish the policy platform for international trade by creating and maintaining a level playing field 
in the global market, which favors superior performing American-made products. Failure to ratify would close those markets to U.S. manufacturers after 2032, since the Montreal Port Protocol prohibits trade with countries not a party to the protocol or its amendments. Ratification signals support for U.S. technology leadership, encourages global competitors to follow our lead, and ensures capturing the projected economic benefits for the U.S. industry, workers, and the overall economy. The Montreal Protocol and all four prior amendments were ratified by the United States with broad bipartisan support under both Republican and Democratic administrations. Fear of higher costs accompanied past refrigerant transitions, but in fact, equipment prices did not increase materially over the course of those transitions, since refrigerants comprise such a small part of the overall system cost. Studies show no significant increases in equipment prices, even if substitute refrigerant costs are multiples of the current costs. The AIM Act phases down HFCs in the United States. The Kigali Amendment phases down HFCs around the world. The world's leading producers of substitutes for HFCs are in Louisiana, New Jersey, Texas, and elsewhere in the United States. The world's fastest growing markets for refrigerators and air conditioners are overseas. U.S. ratification of the Kigali Amendment forces those market, markets into HFC substitutes. This is a viciously competitive, globally integrated industry, and ratification increases the U.S. share of overseas markets and benefits U.S. manufacturers. Again, the AIM Act helps U.S. manufacturers within our borders. The Kigali Amendments helps U.S. manufacturers overseas. Both are essential to sustaining U.S. competitiveness and technology leadership. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Souza. Chairman Menendez, Ranking Member Risch, distinguished members of the committee. I'm Jim Souza, president of the American Tuna Boat Association, which represents the U.S. Pacific Persane Tuna Fleet that operates under the Tuna Treaty. A large majority of the ATA members are multi-generational family businesses with a long history in the U.S. fishing industry. My own family has been involved in the industry for over 90 years, starting with my grandfather, who came to San Diego in 1931. Even before that, my family was a family of fishers dating back to the origins in Portugal generations ago. The same is true for many of my ATA colleagues whose families share that same fishing heritage, whether they came from Portugal, Italy, Croatia, Japan, or elsewhere. Mr. Chairman, ATA strongly supports the South Pacific Tuna Treaty and the amendments to the treaty you are considering here today. We urge this committee and the full Senate to take the necessary steps to provide advice and consent to ratification. For the small island developing states across the Pacific, fisheries resources are often the most significant natural resource available to support their economic development. Engagement in the fisheries sector is often seen by the Pacific Island states as a litmus test for the commitment of other states to support their development aspirations. Swift action by this committee and the full Senate will demonstrate the commitment of the United States to maintaining relationships established under the treaty framework. This is particularly important now as China continues to expand its influence and presence across the Pacific. Because ATA vessels fish widely across the Pacific Ocean, we see the impact of China's activities in the region firsthand. Maintaining a strong and economically viable U.S. fishing fleet in the region is vital to the United States' efforts to counter China's growing influence across the Pacific. Mr. Chairman, 
In addition to a range of technical changes, the amendments before the committee resolved two fundamental problems that had previously threatened not only the future of the treaty, but the future of the U.S. fleet itself. First, the amendments removed the requirements that the U.S. industry payment be paid as a collective lump sum. Historically, the U.S. fleet paid a lump sum to the Pacific Island states for access to fish under the treaty. In late 2015, some U.S. vessel owners were unable to pay their share of the collective licensing fees, and as a result, the entire U.S. fleet was shut down. Under these amendments, each vessel is responsible for a specific payment. If a vessel can't pay, it doesn't get a license, but the other vessels in the fleet will not be adversely affected. Second, the amendments remove the provision that U.S. vessels must have a treaty license to fish in the Western Central Pacific Ocean, including large areas of high seas that previously fell within the defined treaty licensing area. Among other things, U.S. vessels no longer need a treaty license to fish these areas of the high seas. This is a critically important change for the U.S. fleet that absent action by the Senate has not yet been fully implemented. Although some changes are being implemented on a provisional basis, Senate action remains vital. Without this action and appropriate amendments to the implementing legislation, the U.S. fleet may never fully realize the benefits the U.S. delegation worked so hard to achieve through the 2016 negotiations. Ensuring full range of these benefits is critical to the future of the U.S. fleet, which as a result of these and other issues has seen the number of vessels decrease substantially in recent years. Mr. Chairman, if you may allow me, I'll conclude with my personal observation. My first trip to the Pacific Islands was in 1989. At that time, the Pacific Island leaders were of an older generation that showed great respect for the United States due to the sacrifices of this country in liberating the Pacific Islands during World War II and in helping rebuild the destruction left behind in many places. Today, Mr. Chairman, the United States is viewed in a different way by a new generation. In many places, this generation sees China, rather than the United States, as more committed to the future of the Pacific Islands. This perception is something that must be addressed and reversed. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, you, to testify before you today. I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you. Thank you both. We'll start a series of five-minute rounds. Uh, let me uh, uh, turn to Kigali, which entered into force in 2019. And while the schedule for phase downs does not begin right away, the barriers to trade restriction and access to markets is just on the horizon. Mr. Urich, what risk do you see to your member organization from the United States being a non-party to Kigali? Well, I think, you know, as you stated and uh, Dr. Thompson stated, uh, the, the treaty itself has very high uh, enforcement provisions, which would make as of 2033 or 2033 that there could not be trade. However, this is going to start well before that, and the impact on U.S. manufacturers is going to be before 2033, since we are going to be exporting our technology and products, and to those countries that are looking for that expertise, they're going to want to make sure that they're going to be able to select technologies, products, and other things that are going to be there not just today, but also in the future. And if we're not a party, we'll start losing out immediately rather than 2032. So the impact would be great. Now, uh, many, if not most of your organization's uh, design and manufacture equipment and appliances here in the United States, I imagine that many of those products made in the USA are also built for foreign markets as export goods. Uh, what role has U.S. industry played in the negotiation of Kigali? What about prior amendments to the Montreal Protocol and the protocol itself? The U.S. industry and the U.S. government were the leaders and in instrumental in the original Montreal Protocol. They were instrumental in all of the amendments, including the Kigali Amendment. Uh, we were talking earlier with Dr. Thompson where it was in 2008, 2009, where the U.S. industry came to the U.S. government and started the plan to actually come up with the Kigali Amendment that occurred in 2016. So we have been there since the beginning. We've been involved in all the negotiations. And what has been agreed upon in that amendment has been what the U.S. industry wanted 
as well as the U.S. government to make sure that not only our technology, but our expertise and the, uh, the benefit of our U.S. manufacturers and economy would be realized. Mm -hmm. Now, how far ahead are your member companies in manufacturing and marketing of the next generation of what is covered by the Kigali uh, uh, Amendment um, and as compared to your foreign uh, uh, competitors? The, uh, to look at just the refrigerants, uh, the U.S. Uh, manufacturers are leading in uh, the alternative uh, refrigerants that are out there. Um, we have spent, uh, just as an industry association, uh, millions of dollars in research to help us get ready, you know, for this transition and make sure that we have products uh, as well as refrigerants that would be available, uh, not only in the U.S. market, but globally. And so um, it's been billions that have been uh, spent by U.S. industry in developing this, and they want the benefit of being able to sell that technology not only here in the U.S., but also globally. So if we're in uh, the Kigali and are also helping to set standards, we do much better. We do. And um, I think uh, this, the statement, uh, Ranking Member, you were talking about uh, in questioning with Dr. Thompson related to the gold standard. And, and the U.S. still is in this area. Um, the U.S. developed the uh, refrigeration technology with Willis Carrier. Uh, and we have continued to lead in developing that technology, and we want to continue to do that in the future as we look at not only implementing Kigali, but also looking at making these products more efficient uh, and uh, addressing the indoor air quality needs that we've seen uh, with the COVID crisis as well, where our products and our technology and expertise is being looked for. Now, studies indicate that consumers may benefit over the long term if we ratify Kigali. And like the Montreal Protocol, Kigali was designed with consumer interests in mind. Uh, over the long term, do American consumers stand to pay more if we ratify Kigali? Um, con the consumers paying more for our equipment will not be the result of uh, the Kigali Amendment and the changing in refrigerants. What drives the cost uh, of our products are the raw materials that go into it, which is the, the copper, the aluminum, the steel, and, and other things. Um, and they're actually going to benefit from the Kigali Amendment because those raw costs are going up in the expenses, but with the refrigerants, they're more productive, they're more efficient, thereby requiring less of the refrigerant, but also decreasing consumers' uh, energy costs for operating the equipment. So... If you look at just Kigali and where the refrigerants are, it's, it's a net benefit. Where they're going to see increases is because of the supply chain issues and, and the, the raw materials that go into the products. Mm -hmm. That would happen regardless of Kigali. Correct. And now, if we ratify Kigali, would U.S. consumers need to go out and buy new appliances? They would not. That's why it's a phase down uh, over a series of years and it making sure and what the EPA and the AMAC does for implementation in the U.S., is to make sure that if you buy uh, an air conditioner today or a refrigerator, you will be able to use that refrigerator uh, throughout its useful life and not have to replace it early because of a change in refrigerants. Yeah. Um, I have some questions for Mr. Souza, but I want to turn to the ranking members. I'll, I'll yield back to you, Mr. Chairman. I would just uh, say that this has been good uh, panels, and uh, these really need to move, and appreciate uh, the way this has been set up. If I have any more, I'll submit them for the record, but I'll yield Great. back to you, time back to you. Thank you. Uh, I agree with you. Uh, Mr. Souza, uh, your company and your cohorts, uh, represented by the American Tuna Boat uh, Association, have so joined during the tumultuous years that you've been without the certainty that these amendments would provide. Can you tell the committee how things have changed during the last six years in terms of the increased presence of foreign fishing fleets uh, and how they operate, uh, how your uh, cohorts uh, leaving for other waters, and if so, how that has impacted their catch and profitability? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we've seen uh, unfair playing field for the U.S. fleet over the last several years, uh, especially with China. They do not adhere to the labor standards we do, nor to the conservation standards. And it's been something that's put us at a competitive disadvantage. And part of the reason for these amendments within the treaty is to be able to 
help even the playing field for us in some ways, because if we have the right to fish in the high seas, we can't negotiate a, uh, a deal with some of the island countries. We have a negotiating point where they can't hold it over our heads where we can't fish anywhere. And our concern always is you have an influence like China that gets involved with one of these Pacific Island states and tries to undermine the U.S. fleet by telling them to raise the price of access so high that it's impossible for us to pay it. And these amendments would actually, as, as you suggest by your statement, make it easier uh, to fish on the high seas. What it allows us to do, Mr. Chairman, is if we have not come to an agreement yet, we can start fishing on the high seas and concurrently continue our negotiations with the Pacific Island countries and come to an agreement on fishing in their waters. Versus right now, if we don't have an agreement, uh, we don't get the treaty uh, ratifications that are here right now, then we're, we can't fish anywhere in the Western Pacific. We'd have to look elsewhere to fish. Now, one last question, Ben. It's based on your, your statement. I found it interesting. You talked about two different generations in the Pacific Island nations and that this one is more inclined towards China. Uh, I find that interesting because from everything I understand about this uh, uh, subject, China doesn't live under the treaty, doesn't obey necessarily the treaty. We're more uh, cognizant of appropriate fishing practices and conservation questions. Why would they look towards China more so when China actually abuses their fishing grounds? I think to try and put it tactfully, they approach them in a financial way that provides them incentive to look the other way in many instances. <laughs> when you don't want to fish anymore, we'll send you to the State Department. So, uh, <laughs> thank you, sir. I mean, they bribe them. Uh, okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That, that makes it clear. All right. Uh, Senator Kane. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And forgive me, I'll probably ask questions that you might have been digging into, but it's, it's good to join you. And this is a question for Mr. Yurick. Um, those who oppose the Kigali Amendment um, advance the argument that U.S. consumers might suffer because of a higher cost for new products that don't use HFCs. The market transition away from HFCs is already underway, and that's going to occur whether or not the U.S. ratifies the treaty. But it is, uh, you know, an important point to be able to respond to when the issue is raised. Can you talk about the impact of the Kigali Amendment on U.S. consumers? Uh, yes, Senator. Uh this is something that we think about every day. You know, as an industry, we want to make sure, one, the, you know, the products that we manufacture um, are there to make sure that people are comfortable, safe, and, and productive. And they also need to be cost effective. And what the Kigali Amendment does and what the AMAC does is deal with the refrigerants. The amount of cost from the refrigerants is actually less than 1% of the entire cost of the system. Um, where the biggest cost is, is with the, the raw materials, the, the copper, the steel, the aluminum uh, that go into the equipment. And a lot of times um, we have the technology, but to get higher efficiency um, requires more copper and steel because you need more heat transfer area. Um, there's actually a benefit um, with these changes in refrigerants, as we've seen even with the uh, Montreal Protocol, the prior amendments, as well as the Kigali Amendment, these new refrigerants are more efficient, thereby not only requiring less refrigerant, but also reducing the energy cost and the need to have copper, steel, and aluminum. So overall, the impact will be minimal, and hopefully uh, there will reduce the energy use and the, therefore the energy cost over the operation of that system. That's the only question I have. I appreciate that answer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You'll back. Thank you. All right. Um, there is no other member seeking recognition now. Um, I normally don't do this, but because uh, we have your expertise here, is there anything that you haven't made in your statements that we haven't talked about in the Q&A that y you want us to know about these treaties that we haven't talked about? Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I don't believe there is, other than I think it, the importance of moving uh, expeditiously uh, through the process, uh, giving the advice and consent of the, the Senate towards uh, the Kigali Amendment and the other amendments, and moving towards ratification so that we can then continue the implementation and get the benefits that these treaties provide. 
Anything else, Mr. Souza? Uh, Mr. Chairman, probably one last thing that just came to my mind is that the treaty does provide a framework for the U.S. government to um, deal with the Pacific Island nations out there in a very efficient manner, because a lot of these meetings are in one area and everyone's there at one time. So I think it's an efficient way for the interaction between multi-governments and uh, saves a lot of time and uh, effort having to travel around. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I agree with the ranking member that I think these treaties are important. They go to economic interests of the United States, and in some cases, they certainly go to the ability of the United States to extend its influence and counter uh, Chinese influence, uh, particularly in the Pacific. So I hope uh, that we can pursue them in short order and that they will be, we haven't had a treaty approved uh, for quite some time in the United States Senate. Uh, this would be a great breakthrough to be able to do that. Let me thank our witnesses once again for taking the time to give us the insights of the benefits of joining each of these treaties. The record will remain open until the close of business on Friday, April 8th, for senators to submit questions for the record. With the thanks of the committee,